Hello everyone, I'm Richard Soltoon, founder of Richard Soltoon Gallery, based in London. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. This is the first reading group for Hannah Arendt's book, Between Past and Future. Published in 1968, it's considered by many to be one of her best collection of essays. These sessions have been organized on the occasion of the gallery's 12 month exhibition program, dedicated to Aaron's writings. The gallery will have eight exhibitions throughout 2021, drawing on the eight essays in between past and future. It's planned that each exhibition will have a similar reading group. The first exhibition, The Modern Age, opened this week in London and will continue until mid-February. Um, more information um, is available on our gallery website. Today, we are actually starting with the preface to the book. It's an essay called The Gap Between Past and Future. And we are partnering with the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College, New York. Today's meeting is modeled on their own very successful series of virtual reading events. And I encourage you all to visit their website uh, to learn more about these. The Hannah Arendt Center was created in 2006, and I'm honored that Roger Berkowitz, its founder and director, will lead today's event. Roger is Professor of Politics, Philosophy, and Human Rights at Bard College, and has written extensively on Arendt. He's the winner of the 2019 Hannah Arendt Prize for Political Thought. Roger will be in discussion with our guest speaker, Professor Lindsay Stonebridge, Lindsay is based at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and her book, Thinking with Hannah Arendt, will be published next year. Lindsay, thank you for joining us. I also want to thank the panellists, comprising artists, writers, curators, collectors, and other creative thinkers, connecting from Berlin, Dallas, Hawaii, London, New York, and Paris. Uh, forgive me if I just mention one panellist, Vivian Corland, an artist based in New York City, on the panel today and included in our exhibition in London. Uh, Roger, I now uh, hand, hand over to you. Oh, thank you, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to um, thank you, first of all, and, and also Gavin, uh, who's helped curate this exhibit, for um, first for, for dedicating a year of your gallery to an exhibit. Um, uh, inspired by and, and based on or around Hannah, a book of Hannah Arendt's. I think that's a, a bold move. And um, uh, it's, it's exciting to me and to many of us uh, in the world who think Hannah Arendt's work is, is not only important academically, but really meaningful uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a spur to thinking um, in, 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 in everyday life. So thank you. And thanks for reaching out to, to me, to the RN Center and having us um, help uh, curate some of these discussions. As you said, we, we've now had for over six years uh, an online virtual reading group um, where we read RN every week. And um, uh, if you guys, if people do enjoy this, um, I encourage you to check out our website and, and, and consider joining our, our virtual reading group. Um, this book that the, the that the Saltoon Gallery's um, exhibit is based on is called Between Past and Future, um, and it's really one of my uh, favorite books of Hannah Arendt. Even though it's 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 not one of her sort of four main books, you know, which which are are, are monographs. It's a collection of essays. Um, but I'm really excited that over the next year, uh, we will be together in this group uh, reading. Uh, her book, and every week, um, we will uh, every every month or so, uh, we will take on a different one of the essays in the book, and I'll have a guest speaker uh, come and introduce it. Just in case you're uh, interested, next the next session will be on Wednesday, the tenth of February, uh, at the same time, and we'll be reading the first chapter in the book after this prologue called "Tradition and the Modern Age," and we will have as our special guest. Uh, Professor Sheila Ben-Abib, uh, one of the really leading uh, RNT experts uh, in the world. So 
Uh, I'm thrilled and I hope you mark your calendars for Wednesday, the February 10th. Today, uh, I'm thrilled that uh, to kick us off, we're going to have joining us um, Professor Lindsay Stonebridge. Uh, she's from the University of Birmingham. She's uh, written many books, um, many prize winning books. Her two most recent books, um, are the books I know best, are Judicial Imagination, Writing After Nuremberg, and Placeless People, Writing Rights and Refugees. Um, both these books are, are, are engaged with Hannah Arendt and both won the British Academy's Rosemary Crochet Prize. Um, gives you a sense of the quality and breadth of Lindsay's work. She's currently working on a book which should come out next year in 2022 called Thinking Like Hannah Arendt. Um, and I'm thrilled to have Lindsay join us for this discussion. Welcome, Lindsay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here. It's so exciting. I'm very excited about this exhibition. And I'm also really pleased to be talking um, with my friend Roger Berkowitz, who's done so much over the last years to help us understand our end. And I'm just, it's really good to be able to say this publicly, Roger, who's done, done this with such exemplary intellectual generosity and friendship that Arendt herself will truly recognize her legacy in his work. So Roger, you know, you asked me to introduce the preface and to think a bit, we spoke a bit about what it was like to reread this preface. And I think like a lot of people here, I don't come to Arendt as a trained philosopher or a political scientist. I first discovered her as a writer and a literary theorist and a critic. And I think what's always blown my mind about her writing, and it really does blow my mind, and this is really underappreciated in the Academy, is its poetics. That is the extraordinarily creative way that Arendt is always working to find forms to express thinking. So she's, the way she's always working at finding new forms to express thinking. So in this sense, she's really not a straightforward theorist. And she said herself, she's not a philosopher. She is a political theorist, but she's also a kind of artist, which is why this exhibition is so um, exciting. And perhaps also because the citation of and the thinking with other writings so important to her. She's also a kind of curator of how to think, what forms of thinking might take, particularly in the mid um, and late 20th century. And in this respect, the preface, I think, is one of my favorite pieces of her writing. Like you, Roger, I like this book a great, great deal. Because like all really great pieces of writing, the, this little preface actually enacts the thing it's trying to explain. It does what it says on the tin. And that is to say what Arendt is doing, she's not only explaining this crucial gap between the past and the future, which we're going to encounter again and again in the next eight essays, in the next eight meetings, she's actually creating it or recreating it in our minds. So she's she made the gap appear on the page, which I think is extraordinary. So even though I've read this preface countless times, I always feel like I'm reading it for the first time, as though, exactly, as though it's just a text from the future. It's something I don't quite know. But because it's a text of its own time, but linked to us, obviously, I can also feel the pressure of the past on my back as I'm reading. So as I suspect with many of us here um, today, this week I found myself, and what a week to do it in, dwelling in the space of thought that Arendt has created through, she's created it through her use of metaphors, especially spatial metaphors, aphorisms and narrative. And so I found myself sort of lost and holding this obscure space in my own head. So technically, she's and, and technically, I mean, she's she's a masterful thinker. Her mind is brilliant, but just technically, the way she puts things together um, is really really important. I hope we can talk about this too. Okay, so when I say Arendt is finding forms to express thinking, what does that mean? It sounds simple, but we all know it's anything but simple. So why, why, why is this crucial? Why have we got to let, get our heads around this? And I want to go back for a moment to um, Konigsberg, where Arendt was raised and where 
she went to school. And I, I want to go back um, to this um, Prussian city. Um, and I was inspired to do it by looking at Vivian Coolen's work this week, her paintings, which are in the show, and which reference Kunigsberg in really, really interesting ways and really helped me to think a bit more about this. And have, they've been my really kind of beautiful thinking companions the last two days. So thank you, Vivian. Thank but Kunigsberg in the 18th century was very famous as the happening cosmopolitan port of seven bridges. It was known as the Venice of the North. Um, and it has these seven bridges, which very famously, if you want to take a walk around Königsberg, you always have to cross one bridge twice um, if you want to get back to where you started. Now, I mentioned this because it was um, the subject of great mathematical reasoning during the 17th and 18th century. And there's a Euler's theorem which, and graph, which was dedicated to proving why it was you had to cross one bridge twice. Now, Konigsberg is now Kaliningrad. It's a former Soviet exclave. So we've also got that story of the transition from the early 20th century Europe of nation states through to the war, through to the post to the Cold War period, which of course is Hannah Arendt's story. And of course, it's also the home of Kant, who was the first person to really talk about the forms that our thinking takes and how it is that the life, and the emphasis here really is on the life of the mind, not cold reason, the living life of the mind, is not incidental, but essential. Absolutely everything we can know, we can imagine, perceive, and be, crucially, to our lives together, or to our moral lives. And Kant, basically, he taught us that we think, and that how we think, the th forms of thought, have moral consequences. And I read once that I love this quote, she says, you have to have real courage to live in the world as Kant left it. And what she did was rise to that challenge. She found Kant intoxicating. She first read him at 16. I always like to imagine her in Konigsberg crossing the same seven bridges as he did, thinking about Kant, thinking about space, thinking what it meant to appear and disappear into thought. And what she did, of course, she wasn't the only one, but what she did um, is take that project of what it what it means to imagine thinking into the 20th century, which is to say she took that project of imagination and thinking into a world that had fundamentally broken the Enlightenment's moral promise. That's what she did. And so, okay, I'm going to just say a couple of words about the, the preface. How can we see this in this preface to um, this collection, which is a very, very coherent collection. So it's 1961, it's the same year that she'll later go to Jerusalem to report on the Eichmann trial. It's post-war, she's in New York. Arendt is precisely living the gap between past and future, her own as a survivor of refugee, and as she accurately describes that of the modern world, that between space. And now to try and get to that space, to make the gap visible, she uses two aphorisms with a revolutionary bit of revolutionary history in the middle. It's like a sandwich. There are two aphorisms, two literary examples with some history in the middle. I just want to look at the two aphorisms in a bit more detail because they're doing some very, very interesting work in this essay. Now, the first which she opens the essay with is from René Char, the poet, member of the Maquis of the Resistance and a friend of Arendt since her years as a refugee in Paris. And the aphorism is from a collection he wrote during the war. Um, aphorisms are quite handy to write if you're also a member of the resistance and you're very preoccupied and you don't have much time for writing or making art. Ibnor. And Arendt opens the preface by quoting one of them and it reads, it's not an étage, n'est précédé d'un contestement. Our inheritance was not preceded by any testament, which Arendt then translates as, our inheritance was left to us by no testament. Inheritance was left to us by no testament. And she describes this as a strange aphorism and strangely abrupt. And it is quite, it, it, I mean, it's fascinating to try and unpack this aphorism. And what's so strangely condensed in this aphorism is the freedom, what she elsewhere calls the improbable miracle of freedom, the treasure that Shah and his contemporaries experienced as activists, as fighters, during the war, that sense of being out of yourself, absolutely in the world, that allowed Shah to encounter himself and to encounter others. It's just this moment. And what this treasure 
exactly is, she's careful to say, it might be a mirage, it might be a mirage, something unnameable, you can't bottle it, but it's always there, it punctuates through history, it punctuates through revolutionary promise, and she, she cites the French Revolution and the American Revolution, public happiness, public freedom. Now, finding a form to imagine this moment, this now is precisely the issue here, and it's precisely the issue because as Shah says, there's no testament, there's no testimony, no narrative form, no form of rem remembrance for this treasure. And that's precisely why this particular moment is so important because the past forms of representation and remembrance are breaking down are no longer working. So that's the question here is how is the human mind can think this gap when the established tradition of forms has been broken? That's the question. It's our question, of course, to today, and I hope we can talk about that. I think also going back to a Rensselaer time, mid 20th century, it's really helpful to remember that she was by no means the only one attempting to give new narrative, imaginative form to that between um, moment. Um, René Charles was also a good friend and a near neighbor of Samuel Beckett's in the Roussillon. And at the same time as he was writing his aphorisms, Beckett, who was also in the resistance, was writing what? And if you read what alongside um, Arendt's um, past and future, you see that that text too is full of gaps and thresholds and spaces between. And it's also written, again, like a lot of Arendt's writing between at least two languages, like it flips between French and English. So that moment of mid 20th century possibility of new worlds uh, and also desperate fear and desperate time. The question that Arendt's getting to, which is political and aesthetic, is how do we represent it? Now, heritage, heritage, as Arendt says, refers to inheritance, what you're left, what's willed to you, what's bequeathed to us. And that was the sense that that was missing. That's the break in tradition. But will, of course, has two meanings. What is willed to us, what's left, and will, what we want to do, what we think ourselves into doing. To will is also to, to a prelude to an act. And actually, Mark Hutchinson, in his translation of the Shah, um, just says, no will testifies to our inheritance. So he really just emphasizes the will, not the heritage or the, the heritage. So how we think, how we will, and how we potentially act in the past and future is what she's interested in in that second aphorism from Kafka. Now, Kafka is Arendt's constant companion. She was, she was engaging with Kafka's thought before Kafka was Kafka, right? She was back in the 30s, listening to um, Benjamin talk about Kafka in Berlin in her 20s. She edits his diaries later, she writes two key essays, but this is before people were starting to talk about the Kafkaesque. And what she loves about um, Kafka is the way he gives us blueprints for thought, for thinking, for the life of the mind. To writers, she says, often seem to describe how the outside world appears. Kafka turns inward and describes the inner mind. He shows us where we are when we retreat from the world, when we are purely thinking. And the parable that she chooses, um, and she returns to it again and again uh, throughout, throughout her thinking, and it's a very early one, gives us a particular x-ray of what it, the thinking ego is like, what it's doing in time. So two quick final but important points about the parable, which you'll remember features a protagonist struggling between the past pushing behind him and the future bearing down upon him. Now, the first point here is worth emphasizing, it's not just about the gap between past and future to which we can kind of just wallow around in. It's about the struggle itself. Now, Rent is very clear that there's only a struggle between the past and the future because man is between them. Otherwise, she says the two forces would just cancel each other up and it's no problem. In other words, it's the experience, the human experience, the struggling between times that Arendt really wants to highlight here and she really wants us to know. And this is why the diagonal of freedom, you'll remember she talks about um, a parallelogram. So there's the um, past stretching back to infinity, and then there's a the future stretching forward into infinity. She says it's actually like a parallelogram of forces. And then she draws a diagonal of freedom between them, coming from the point at which the man or what man 
sits and the diagonal moves across. It's just a brilliant creative move. And if you look in the archives of, 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 of Arendt's, Arendt's archive, you can see her little drawings of this diagonal of freedom. Because what she's drawing is the line towards not only giving a form for that moment of now, but for what she calls this diagonal of freedom. And what's uh, so rich about this, it's not a kind of like, I'm gonna step out of time and theorize and tell you all where we are and where we can fit in history, master it. Um, she, she, try, she doesn't want us to step out of time. This is why she's not a theorist, she's an experimentalist. She wants us to stay in the moment of experiencing a broken tradition and a future to come. Now, I think this is why I'm so excited about this seminar. As thinkers and writers and artists and doers, I think we all exist potentially on that diagonal. Um, and that's what I'd like us to think through a bit more carefully. But my final question, and this is also a question to the directly to the artists here, is whether Arendt's own diagonal of freedom is now not itself broken. She was writing 60 years ago. So what we're doing when we're reading this text today is actually reckoning with a past that was Arendt's present. So it's another diagonal shooting up. And my question, I guess, is can we still, as thinkers, writers, people, people with moral responsibilities to each other, people with imaginations, can we still grab a ride on that diagonal of freedom? Or in other words, what is our inheritance? I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just put up a picture that Arendt drew, uh, if you guys can see it, of, of the parallelogram of forces. This uh, came out in, in The Life of the Mind, but that's what Lindsay was describing. Um, you know, Lindsay, I, I'll ask one question and then we'll open it up to the panel. Um, you, you, ask, you, you ended with this question of, is the diagonal, is the diagonal broken? Is this um, gap broken, I guess, is another way of thinking about it. Is, and, and, and from Arendt's point of view, you know, she says something very interesting. She, she says, this, this gap has always existed, right? There've always been thinkers in it, but they were pretty rare. Yeah. You know, they were the, they were the Plato's and the Aristotle's and the Jesus's and, and the Buddhists, you know, I mean, they, and, 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 and most people didn't have to think because the gap was papered over, she says, by tradition, right? Papered over by, um, uh, you know, a tradition that told us how to think and told us how to act. And we didn't have to do that. And she's writing, as you said, amidst the break of this tradition. That's one of her constant themes. And what she says is, amidst the break, we're suddenly in a position where all of us are now in the position that Plato was in, right? We're all in the position where we have to think for ourselves and we can't rely on the tradition. Um, and we're not ready for it. So even when she's writing, she's saying we're not ready for it. And she says, we have to learn again how to think um, without the tradition, what she calls sometimes thinking without banisters. Um, uh, and she says the eight essays that are gonna follow this are exercises in how to think. Um, and, and, and this is important for those of us who are gonna read these essays over the next year in this reading group. When Arendt talks about thinking, she makes an important distinction. She says the thinking is not about truth, it's about meaning. And so if we're going to engage in thinking about the world, we're not gonna try and figure out what's true about it. We're gonna try and figure out what's meaningful about it. And that's the exercises that's what these exercises are about, is trying to um, encounter that. Um, you know, so she says, as Lindsay says here, that the, the metaphor that she offers is this gap between past and future. In another book of hers, her last book, which she never finished, she says, there is no metaphor for thinking. Um, and so maybe, I mean, Lindsay, you know, maybe the question is, is the gap do you think is a do you think it's a it's a metaphor that fails, or is it one that she um, holds on to? Because in the life of the mind, she says there is no metaphor for thinking. She says she doesn't even, she says the closest one is Aristotle's, 
who says that without the breath of life, the human body is a corpse and without thinking the human mind is dead. Mm -hmm. um, but then she says, even that can't be a metaphor for thinking because thinking a metaphor bridges the visible and the invisible and that bridge can't be fully bridged. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I don't, I'm wondering if, if, if the metaphor, I'm wondering how real the metaphor is for you, Lindsay. I mean, mm -hmm. and then we can open it up to others as well, maybe. I think, I mean, metaphors are always kind of broken by default as well as operative. Mm -hmm. So I want to hang on to exactly the sense of thinking not as truth, but thinking as constantly engaging with meaning. And I, and I, and I get that there is a kind of, you know, that it, 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 it's not you know, a, a specific moment in historical time that's then lost, it's punctuated, we're punctuated at that same moment. I guess my question was, I think in some, some ways Arendt saw where we are now. And I'm thinking about, you know, the space, the, the spaces into which we can disappear. Um, so in order to be Plato, um, or in order to have a life of the mind. And I'm thinking here, I was rereading The Human Condition recently as well, is, you know, how it is that our private lives are now so public. I mean, everything, every kind of intimacy is now exposed. Whereas the very things that should be public, politics, accountability, debate, are totally obscure. So I think, I guess my question about the diagonal is not the diagonal itself or thinking itself or all the things you say is just, I think it is more difficult than it was in 1960. But reasons that Arendt totally predicted, and I think she's absolutely right, because of you know what the spaces of thought um, have been um, corrupt, or yeah, corrupted yeah. and, and yeah. turned inside out. Yeah. And and many of the essays in this volume are about that, whether it's about the loss of the loss of non-political places where we can talk about truth in truth and politics, or the loss of education and the private sphere where we can grow as a person before we enter the social sphere, mm -hmm. um, or the crisis of culture where art and the artist who is for her supposed to engage with the long durée, the enduring works, suddenly has to enter a marketplace. All of these are things that corrupt what you're calling that space of thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and so these essays are all about that. So um, we're actually on the time frame that Richard gave me. I'm shocked, but I'm going to open it up to the, so we have, we have, the, we have 20 panelists here who are um, artists and curators and, um, and some friends of, of the gallery and the center. And if you guys have questions for Lindsay, um, we have some time for that. And then afterwards we can open it up to the uh, wider webinar participants. So for the panelists, if you have questions, just, just, just speak and interject because there's only about 18 of you, if anyone does. Um, I have a question for Lindsay, if that's okay. Um, yep. I'm Pauline D'Souza, Director of Diversity Art Forum. Um, I was very interested in the force of thinking Arden talks about uh, forces and about, and you mentioned the diagonal, but what is not really discussed is the actual speed of that force, the speed of thinking. Because I was thinking about the processes of when we slow down and think, and then when we speed up and think. And I was just wondering how that works in relation to the force of thinking and the action after we think, or the action of thinking. And I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Roger can can too. And she she talks, you know, the, one the, two of the favorite, my favorite quotes. The one she says, um, maybe I like this because of my own age, but you know, she says, thinking thinking is ageless, <laughs> and and I, so that in some ways it is. And she's not. She's. It's, I mean, we know all this, don't we? Because we we think um, as we think, and we don't think in time. Um, so in some ways, you know historical force and force of the future are going around this sort of you know the the, the 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 moment of the of the continual present but it's not a mysticism for her end um and there's also um the way she'll talk about what it means to appear and disappear in time so you know sometimes i am and sometimes i think so sometimes i'm appearing in the world and at that point i'm in the temporality of the world i'm in its time um and other times um, i'm thinking and i disappear and therefore I'm in a different 
time. So you're quite right. There is this sort of, I mean, it is like looking at a collage of, um, you know, there, there are certain things that clearly are moving about time. But what, just one more point, what, is, what I think is really exciting about that is not a kind of mysticism, not kind of um, a temporal eternity, although she will talk about the semi-temporal. It is um, always in the world of time, yet um, in this sort of, a kind of, I guess the point about also is the he in the Kafka parable is resisting the forces as he's struggling as well, which would be the other point. But Roger, do you want to come in here on? I'll just, I'll just add two quick thoughts on this because I think it's a great question. Yes, One is that um, Arendt um, really offers uh, two examples uh, throughout history of, of thinkers um, about the world. One is um, Karl Jaspers, our, her mentor, and the other is Socrates. And um, the image of Socrates that she, that she employs to talk about thinking is if some of you may remember if you read the symposium, when Socrates is on the way to the symposium um, and he stops in the middle of the street and stands there for three or four hours thinking and the daemon, his daemon appears on his shoulder and he won't go again until he's figured out his thought. And Arendt says, that's the time of thinking. She says, you have to stop and think. Um, and, and what she says about thinking is that it has no impact on the world because it's not a real thing. It's in your head, except in one scenario. She says, when the whole world has gone crazy, right? And lost its head in a time of totalitarianism or mass movements or whatever, the thinker becomes impactful in the world simply by stopping by not joining with the movement and by thinking. And that, 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 that sort of temporal slowness um, actually has a political impact on the world because the thinker abstains from, um, from politics. Um, the other temporal aspect of thinking that, 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 I, that, that came to mind, Pauline, was is that, um, and this relates very much to artists, um, for Arendt, uh, an artist or a thinker um, has to think outside of the flow, right? As I was saying before, out, it has to stop and move out. And they then, after they think, they put their words or their creations into the world. And, and, that, and, 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 and then those things become part of a common world, part of what she calls culture, uh, an enduring art-filled world that we share. And as the generations speed up, she says, as people, as generations go quicker, and as there's, there's the world keeps getting destroyed more and more, and the du and the duration of thought things diminishes, and that reduces the humanity of the world because increasingly we're constantly having to live in a world that's foreign to us, and there's no home, and it's the loss of home that that is so devastating in the ever more. Uh, rapid change of generations that has happened in the last few centuries. So those were just two other ideas um, that came up. Lindsay, do you want to? No, I was just thinking as you were talking about um, the thinker who re retreats from um, the moment the world goes mad in order to think, but she was always quite um, um, suspicious of inner immigration, the way that a lot of people just said I retreated into the mind and inner immigration was a term that Thomas Mann used and was related to people who stayed in, 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 not, in the Third Reich. Um, because the other side to thinking was a way of re-engaging with moral responsibility. So it's, you know, thinking and moral considerations, thinking is not, it is a retreat of the world, but in order to have another moral relationship to a world um, that has gone, gone mad. Yeah, I think she, she's very suspicious of many quote unquote inner immigrants, but for someone like Jaspers, who she says was an inner immigrant, who in his inner, inner immigration stood out so, so um, brilliantly in his refusal to partake in the Nazi world, that his inner, inner immigration actually was a light in dark times. And so, um, you know, she, she does make that distinction, but I mean, she's, you're right, she's critical of many other so-called inner immigrants um, who just used it as an excuse. 
Are there other? Uh, just yeah, like Mark, to, before, we, Mark, before we leave Lindsay, I just want to commend you for calling her an artist. And I may not have another chance uh, because we'll be talking about her ideas, but uh, her style is something that I find amazing. And this is a woman who grew up in German, learned, you know, spoke French when she was in France and comes to this country. I know she had editors. I knew one of them very well, but it's amazing. She's so such an exciting writer. Even with all of these long sentences, sometimes take a whole paragraph with the semicolons and so on. So thank you for saying that. It's, I think it's a side of her that I really just think is astonishing. Yeah, I, I do too. And I think it's so, I mean, Roger and I have spoken about this before, but it's so under-remarked. I mean, people will talk about Benjamin and Adorno and their style yeah. and blah, 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 and you think origins of totalitarianism was a rethinking of how to do history. Yeah. Well, from a woman, a young woman, who was living in the middle of it, yeah. in her third language, by the way. Yeah. Third, yeah, third. Could I, could um, I say something, please? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, yes, I'm very interested in the, uh, when you brought up Jaspers, because I think there's a very fundamental difference between Jaspers and René Char. Um, I enjoyed the beginning of the essay. I actually thought we were supposed to read the first chapter as well. And I enjoyed the beginning of the essay and the two um, uh, parables, if you like, far more than the second chapter in its uh, much more abstract argument. But I mean, what I wanted to say was, while I am very, very impressed by Jasper's writing, Die Schuldfrage, so early on, the question of German guilt that was immediately translated into French, I just happen to know, what Shah is describing is this cessation of normal, not only normal life for the individual with his possibility of having a real lived life in their existence, but also the complete crumbling of all, um, all certainties and moral truths of the state and the performance of his fellow citizens of something in a deeply, deeply shocking way. Now, on the one hand, there's all the moral collapse that he's writing from which is of course parallel, if you like, to Jasper's. But this possibility of action is not something that is a universal thing from the point of gender. Not that I want to go into gender discussions, please, but basically Hannah Arendt is writing all the way through um, as a disembodied moral voice when the liberty she describes is not a universal liberty. She could never herself have had that break in her life and the kind of liberty that Shah is describing. And of course, I absolutely admire and, and um, am full of admiration at both her achievement and the lucidity of her style. But there is a kind of a major, major difference in the break, even the break of Beckett, that, that Beckett or Shah were able to experience and what was available to her because basically she remains and gloriously fulfills the role of an intellectual worker, what the French say, a travailleur intellectuel, and this um, specifically genderless taking on of the huge traditions of philosophy. But the liberty she's talking about is a very circumscribed liberty, for example, not available to Simone Weil or to Simone de Beauvoir. So I just wanted to make that point because the, liberty, the, the, the stunning way she begins is nonetheless, in one way, I feel very coded apropos of, of li liberty as a potential, uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to the potential of thought. So I just wanted to put that in because I'm quite, a, I'm quite specialized in this particular period. And the, I believe the first edition of this book is 1954, which is before the Images of Man exhibition at the MoMA in New York where Paul Tillich, the German emigre the theologian, writes the preface and doesn't actually dare to, I mean, deliberately wishes not to use the word Holocaust. And, um, um, and, and in 1952, Max Raphael, also an emigre to New York, is going to commit suicide because of the uh, dreadful weight of what he is bringing. Obviously, Hannah Arendt is a stronger intellectual, one could argue, than, than, than Raphael. But I, I just wanted to really, I don't know, point up how I, I feel that moment was for emigres in New York and the questions of action versus thought. 
So thank you very much. Can I jump in before Lindsay or Roger respond to that? Because I think what I wanted to say- Can you just introduce yourself, Barry? Um, oh, so yeah, I'm uh, you Barry Schwabsky, art critic, poet. And um, uh, because I also had wanted to point out a kind of unspoken uh, delimitation uh, in this uh, preface. And this has to do with the fact that, for instance, when she talks about revolutions, uh, she mentions uh, the American War for Independence, uh, but not the Haitian one. She mentions Paris in 1789, uh, not Paris in 1871. She mentions uh, Hungary in, uh, in, the 19th, in 1956, uh, no mention of Algeria. Um, and when she talks about Char and the French resistance, uh, there's no reflection on the relevance or not of the uh, kind of predominance of communists in the French resistance and what that kind of pre-existing organization might have meant for the ability of these free individuals to be more, become more than individuals in in their action under those you know horrific circumstances so uh yeah uh lindsay i wonder if you could talk about some of these kind of unspoken uh frameworks of yeah her reference I mean, points Lally, i mean just going back to Sarah's point about um, gender. I was thinking just recently the irony of Arendt says in her interview with Gunter Gauss, and it's true, and it was in 1933 that she decided thinking wasn't enough. She'd had enough of intellectual, she had to take action. And, and that was the time she then worked um, briefly because she was caught um, for um, the German Zionist organization researching anti anti Semitic propaganda um, in the State Library, and she was caught by the Gestapo. Um, and I, I only thought about it this recently is, of course, going back to your point, Sarah, her first moment of action, <laughs> political action, was undercover. <laughs> she did it quietly. She did it precisely because as a woman and an academic, not a political Zionist, she would not get caught. And I kind of think that that kind of went right the way through her life, um, that doubling. And you know, it is a major gap. And it's, it's such a major gap. You can, it, it's present. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and Barry, yes, I mean, the, the blindnesses are there all the time, but the irony which curls around as you're trying to account for this is extraordinary. I've, I've been trying to write about her essay on Little Rock, which is a kind of companion to the education essay that we'll read later. And there is Elizabeth Eckford trying to walk back alone, having you know, surrounded by a racist mob in Arkansas in 19. 57. And so she's another very clever little girl trying to appear in the world, or trying not to appear in the world, actually, in Elizabeth Exford's sense, she to disappear. And Arendt can see herself, but she cannot see the specific of American racism and its legacy and the slavery. So these moments, I think, are, are you're both absolutely right, they're absolutely there, but they're so... Um, pointed and twisted within the within her her thought they become revelatory those 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 gaps are themselves um i think worth probing um and thinking with um at the same time um but the, the essay on little rock just you know I, I know i have to write about it but it it kind of breaks my heart um to do so to at the same time this is the woman who deconstructed European colonialism gave one of the best accounts of European imperialism I've ever read. Um, and, uh, yeah. um, could, could I say mm. something? Um, it's, it's, yeah, is that okay? Introduce yourself, Vivian. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I'm Vivian uh, Kurland, and I'm one of the artists in the show that's, that's up at the uh, Saltoon Gallery at the moment. Um, I'd like to uh, address the question, Lindsay, that I think you 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 put to the artists, 
but I want to address it in the form of a question, but I want to uh, come, come to it by making uh, just a couple of other uh, observations, if I may. F firstly, I don't know if you can, you can see this uh, astonishing uh, image. It's actually a postcard from 1938. Uh, it's, it's Germany, Hitler's Germany, and here's Königsberg. I just, I don't know how clearly you can see it, but I just think it's such a sort of striking uh, image. Um, can you see it? Yes, we can. All right. Um, I, I think um, some time ago I, I listened to uh, Anne um, Heveler, is it, uh, uh, about her, her book on, uh, on Hannah Arendt. And she, uh, and I don't know if I'm getting this right because I don't know if I remember it. And I haven't actually even read the book, but I listened to her, what she, what she said about her book. And um, she, she speaks about, I think, uh, three, uh, uh, three major or a sort of ur traumas in, in Hannah Arendt's life. And I think that the first one that she, that she uh, mentions is um, the, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Arendt uh, need, they, they had to leave uh, Königsberg. And this was the first trauma of her life. They had to leave when she was a little girl because of her father's illness. And then I think that the, the second uh, trauma in this, uh, in this brilliant girl's life was the it was not to, a few a couple of years later the death of her father, and and finally I, I think that the third trauma and certainly I, I would I would think that this is the third trauma not even having to leave Germany in thirty three or whatever, the third trauma was it, what I'm calling her crucifixion in New York over what she'd written uh, about uh, Eichmann and the Eichmann trial. And so um, when, when, when I read this um, essay first, uh, uh, the, uh, the preface, the preface, the gap between past and future, I, I was, um, I didn't, I don't think I fully appreciated just uh, how much of a poet uh, Arendt was and, and how well she knew poetry. I mean, she was really a poet's poet or a poet's thinker. And so I, I wondered why she had um, chosen to, uh, to, uh, put, to quote uh, René Char. And, and then I think at a certain point in, in, in trying to understand what his, um, what his, uh, what his words mean, um, I thought perhaps it had something to do with the fact that I think that he was uh, very close with Martin Heidegger, but but I'm not sure that that's the reason. It might have been why he was so much on her uh, radar. But in in fact, I now think that um, part of it is it's odd, but part of it is an expression of um, her love for America. I know this sounds crazy, but this was her adopted home, and as Roger has said, in the short while I've known him many times, how much she loved. Uh, America. And, and I guess it's because, you know, America must have been her savior. So I think that if, um, if I can just read these uh, words by Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, no one, uh, in, what is it? the one thing which we seek with insatiable desire is to forget ourselves, to lose our um, uh, uh, sempiternal memory and to do something without knowing how or why. This is a, a very much a sort of parallel in, in, in how she describes, uh, you know, the going naked and losing Charles and, uh, and the resistance and losing themselves in action and in participation. And then, um, uh, am I making sense so far? I'm coming to the point here about the, the parallelogram. The, yeah, just come. Let's let's try and get the question so we can get one or two more in, Vivian. Yeah, yeah. The 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 free the freedom thing. I think that um, um, uh, that um, that 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 this uh, the way the way that she speaks about it uh, in 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 quoting Shah and discussing Kafka and all of it, re, uh, it brought me to it. it it, brought, it reminded me of later writing by Georgia Agamben, where he, when he discusses testimony as as a lacuna, and the idea that you know uh, um, that um, that no one has ever come back to describe or say what happened because it, 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 because they died only and, and survivors, 
you know, uh, uh, and, and Wiesel, he says, to those who have not lived through an experience will never know, and those who have will never tell. And then Agamben says, you know, uh, uh, just as no one has ever returned to describe his own death, is a little bit like uh, the idea of this, uh, of this treasure. And, and, and I think that she, uh, uh, so her words, I think on, on, on page five, when she, uh, when she says um, there, may, there exists many good reasons to believe that the treasure was never a reality, but a mirage, this treasure, this freedom, I suppose, this losing, and um, uh, 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 nothing substantial but an apparition, the best, um, and the best of these reasons is that the treasure thus far has remained nameless. So, um, so uh, uh, I, I think, so I just wanted to say that I think that the when you said, I think you asked the question about freedom in relation to that, and I think that, um, uh, no, it, it, well, we're far from it. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Lindsay, you, can, you, um, can you offer something in response? Yeah, no, that was, I want to, I want to go back to the postcard. <laughs> I might um, email you, that, that was fascinating. Yeah, I kind of, I think this, it's, in, I mean, sorry, this is the scholar nerd in me. Um, Arendt had to leave Hanover where she was born and that they went back to Konigsberg. And I think that was, you know, she was, she was tiny, but I think the trauma of her father is absolutely right. Cause he was, he, 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 had, he had syphilis. So he was not only died, he, 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 he disappeared. He, he went mad. And I always think- Before he died, yes, yeah. it was a terrible yeah. thing, yeah. And I kind of, I always imagine sort of reading Kant, you know, Kant's great stuff on the Lisbon earthquake when he asks, as we are asking today, oh my God, what, what, when you just, something like that has just been torn through, when something's just been so decimated, how can I believe in thought? How can I believe in God? Um, and I always think that you know, the, the, the girl mourning her father who then reaches for these, for these, um, these moments. So yes, I think you're right. There's, there's, there is a, a kind of idealization of America in, in, in Arendt, but there's also a kind of a, a, a cross wanting to be better. And I think of the later papers too, which I think is not um, an idealism. And I also think, I mean, um, Sheila Benaby talks about so beautifully in her book, Reluctant Modernism with Hannah Arendt. She's a modernist. She want, she, she, she's always after that lost thing. She was always trying mm. to find it, always mourning. She always wants the aesthetic distance, which makes her a modernist, not a postmodernist. Um, but she always knows somehow that, that that freedom is compromised. And it's compromised by politics, it's compromised by reality, it's compromised by being in the world. I absolutely agree with you that I think we're a long way today from that freedom. Well, and just that it's more, more broken than ever, more yes. Broken. Yeah, and that the, the task, and I don't know if it's a task to think back or a task to think forward, um, but because in lots of ways, the forms of thought that we're now thinking today are terribly exciting. And there is that kind of newness as well as um, a kind of mourning for something lost. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I loved your intention. Thank you. Can I just jump in about that, that uh, point? Uh, sorry, Roger. Who is this? Oh, go ahead. Gavin Delahunty. Oh, hi, Gavin. I, sorry, I can't see it. No worries. Um, I just wanted to jump in about, about on, on the diagram, I guess, uh, and, and how that has sort of woven its way to the entire conversation. And, and I, I wanted to say Gavin, how important- Gavin, sound is low. I don't know if everybody can hear him. Oh, I, yeah, we can hear you. Just turn up your volume. It's a little, just maybe move closer to your computer. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah. The diagram is so, uh, for me, centrifugal to, 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 to both to this talk, but also to the sort of impetus for the whole project, because in the, ori in the original diagram, which you can Google for those who haven't seen it and, and, and do it with re relative ease, but there's something about the st statistical quality of it. It's a sort of hard, rigid unbending like equation like so there's the line going up that says future and then there's a line coming down that says past and then this train thought that's going up and 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 even the word train 
like that sort of industry, what that evokes, this sort of industrial, um, slow moving, singular line, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I've had that printed out and I've sort of been, you know, meditated on it. And I, and I, and I think that the, where we sort of find ourselves, you know, it, 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 I had, I had actually doodled this quite early on, um, which, you know, we are, we are in this moment in the center, but the, there is this pressure from the past and the future, but it's now this sort of fracturing, you know, there's this, and all of these wiggly lines for me are what you just said, Lindsay, it, it, there's a certain potentiality right now that I think is worth reaching out for, you know, and, and you know, the, for me, the original diagram by Arendt communicates so much because in a way it, it illustrates its problem. It, illustra it illustrates the problem, but you, you know, it's like too rigid. And that was a frustration for her, where now we find ourselves in this position where the past and the future is, is, is the, the pressure is upon us, but it's not, we no longer live in a light in a time with a train thought. We live in a time of an internet highway. You know, we live in a time of a sort of exploded sense of, of how information is transported and how it's communicated. And, and to me, I think that is the real exciting and, and, and sort of stimulating and using the book as a sort of abstract material to understand the present, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and I do think we find ourselves now in, in, a, in a moment where Arendt herself, I think, would be excited, you know, um, because we can't rely anymore on the past uh, and, and we're all scared shitless of the future, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so I just think that, I just think that is such a, and you can feel it, it's in the air, you know, and that, and that in a way is why there's a, an errant renaissance, you know, we, we, you know, I think that in the nineties, it's certainly it's, it's been prominent since the nineties, you know, since I was a student, but I think right now, I think there's a sort of renaissance uh, and, and, and again, to the, this idea of the, if you look at the tiles, for those of you who can see the tiles of the webinar, the multitude of thinking that is on, on view today in this webinar is representative of that exciting potentialness. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. I think that's, that's really right on. I'm gonna just bring this, where if we have just two minutes left and there's a question from the um, participants and I thought, Lindsay, I'd get you to respond to it. Uh, it's from John McCready, who's an RN scholar down in Texas. Um, you described, Lindsay, the poetics of RN as a creative activity for developing forms for expressing thinking mm -hmm. and her thought as experimentalist. Mm -hmm. um, and he's wondering uh, how you might compare RN to painters like Pollock, Rothko, Klein, and Gottlieb. Um, who uh, are also in that sort of formal and experimental uh, uh, ideal. Yeah, hi, hi, John. Um, that's a really great question. I mean, it's not, I kind of want um, um, to put it back to, to, to Sarah Wilson because the same question, of course, she, she, she didn't have the canvases um, of the people you, you mentioned. And it's actually quite interesting because I think she's a verbal artist. So even though she, talks a lot in spatial metaphors um, and she her words do things with space I mean I think the human condition is one of the most peculiar um, pe peculiarly written books ever but she my publisher Jonathan Cape turned down the human condition because the editors just don't understand what's going on here um, but I think she's more a, a, a verbal experimentalist um, than the kind of writer who who thinks vision and then works that way. But I certainly, absolutely with you, I think what is underappreciated, it's underappreciated. I mean, I think Simone Weil, who, who, who Sarah also mentioned is another one, just an absolutely extraordinary um, verbal thought, um, which was experimental, innovative, um, and, 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 and exercising, not trying to kind of master reality or master truth, but putting things in different forms 
has been massively um, um, underappreciated and we, we are still right. learning from it. And that's why with Gavin, um, my sense of excitement about this seminar is what do we do with that thinking um, now? So, you know, Arendt and the Art of Now, I think, is maybe a, a, the second more interesting question now. Thank you. So let me, um, let me wrap up with a couple of closing comments. Um, I think it was Sarah who said that she had read the next essay, um, Tradition in the Modern Age, and thought found it a little um, denser and more academic. And, and so let me say yes. Um, uh, but the, the, the following eight essays, um, uh, Arendt says, are exercises in this, in this experience of thinking, in this activity of thinking. And she divides them into three parts. So she says that the first part, which is two essays, Tradition in the Modern Age and the Modern Concept of Tradition, um, uh, look at what's been broken, the break of tradition, and look at how this tradition, which had papered over this gap for many centuries, has, has fallen away. The second two part is the essays on authority and freedom. Uh, which looks at uh, these conceptual ideas of authority and freedom and, and tries to show how they are um, rethought in the modern age. And then the last section are four essays um, that look at particular events, the rise of, of mass culture, uh, the rise of kind of um, democratic education, uh, the, 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 the rise of mass lying and the rise of our artificial intelligence and technology and ask how do we think um, a response to those today. Um, some of them are going to be easier and some of them are going to be more difficult, but I hope that if you um, come and join us, we will give you a path through them uh, over the next year as we read these eight essays. So um, as I said, the next group is going to be February 10th with Sheila Benabib, who Lindsay mentioned. Uh, and I hope you'll join us. And I want to thank Lindsay Stonebridge for uh, getting us through the preface, which is a wonderful job, a wonderful essay. And, and you did a great job, Lindsay. Thanks very much. That's thank good. you, Lindsay. Thank you. And thanks to Gavin and, and to Richard and, and the whole Richard Satoon gallery team for, uh, for hosting this. Um, and thanks to thank all you of you for Thanks, Gary. Thank